In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate, blessings and mercy of God be upon his prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon you all. This is a lecture dedicated to second year per S, per M students for the academic year 2022-23 at the level of the Teachers Higher College Talab Abdurrahman in Laguat, Algeria. In the module that is entitled Introduction to Linguistics. First and foremost, as a revision, when we say linguistics, it is a noun that refers to a discipline and it is derived from language, language, linguistic, adjective, linguistics, now. First of all, what is linguistics? Linguistics is defined, is agreed upon to be defined as the scientific study of language. A question, what is meant by scientific? When we say scientific, we refer to an adjective that is derived from a noun, science. What is science? Science, not in contrast, but in reference to knowledge. What is the difference in between knowledge and science? Science is a part, is a part of knowledge. Any knowledge needs to become a science, needs three conditions. The first condition is called the field of research or the subject of study, the subject of study. In medicine, for example, the subject of a study is the human body. Whereas in linguistics, the subject of a study is human language, is a human language. Before we moved forward, the definition of language is mandatory. Language is what? Is a set of sounds, words, utterances, gestures, interjections, body movements, facial expressions that are used within a specific community in order to communicate. This is the aim of language, is communication with the previously mentioned elements. Back to the first condition, which is field of research or subject of study, which is human language. Sometimes we cannot well know, identify human language without referring to animal language. It is important to make a kind of comparison in between the two, or contrast meanwhile. We will come back to this point, comparison and contrasting between human and animal language. So we move forward towards the second condition, which is theoretical background. What is meant by theoretical background? A theoretical background is the raw material or the, all the previously tackled aspects made by, carried out, investigated in by researchers and field specialists. That means theories, hypotheses, attempts, endeavors that were all pouring in the same stream of this field of knowledge that is science, theoretical background, or it is called, in other words, literature review. The third condition that must be present that is related to science is the scientific method. When we say the scientific method, here we mean several steps that are compulsory to be followed in order to be working with guidelines that are necessary for every science. First of all is observation or identification of the phenomenon or the problem. So beforehand, these steps are, as we have said, related to research. So what is meant by a research? A research is an academic activity that adds new 
aspect, new angle, new part to the already existing stock of knowledge. So it is an academic activity. That means an academic activity process that is carried out usually inside an academic official institution within a lab, laboratory, or something that looks like for the availability of all the necessary materials and equipments. This is academic, academic activity that adds something new. When we say new, so here, newness, novelty is important for any academic research. If you or if we don't bring something new in one way or another, so here we cannot talk about a research, we just merely talk about an expose, an expose. When you say an expose, that means a given person uh, tries to make an attempt in order to gather, in order to amass results of others. So M Mr. Rex has carried this research, Mrs. Y has also carried this research and found those findings, those results in a kind of comparison, contrast, exposure. This is not uh, a research, this is just uh, an expose. This is just an expose. So, uh, an academic research is, uh, is the one that is uh, linked to newness, to novelty, to novelty. So, uh, back to the point, so observation, identification of the problem, identification of the problem, and then making what is called hypothesis, hypothesizing. We do hypothesize for two main aims. The first aim is to give an explanation to the phenomenon. Why is this phenomenon the way it is? Why? What is the interpretation? This is, yeah, this is the, this is the why. The other way of hypothesizing is to suggest a therapy, a remedy, a treatment, a solution. A solution. And then we move towards a crucial step, which is, which is testing or experimenting. Usually, usually, when you talk about experiments, we talk about quasi, for example, or any other type in which we have a control group and an experimental group. That means a group which is meant to control the other. The other one, the other one, which is the field, which is the raw material, which is the which is the sample on which the experiment is going to be carried out, and then when implementing the the strategy of the re, of the experiment of the research, then by the end we are going to make a kind of comparison or contrast in between the control group and the experiment group, and then we would say whether our hypothesis. Uh, have been validated, approved, or disapproved. And of course, we may, we may, as we may not talk about, this depends on the nature of the research, on uh, reliability of the results, then we may talk about theories, or uh, we may uh, have it uh, considered as uh, many other hypotheses that, that are still debatable, like, for example, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which is still uh, uh, considered to be a thorny topic that is uh, in a dire need for more elaboration and more discussion. Uh, so these are the three main conditions related to scientificness of linguistics. Linguistics is a science. That means it has three conditions. The first one is the subject of a study, which is language, human language in particular. And then we have uh, the theoretical background or literature review. And thirdly, we have the scientific method through its uh, uh, main mandatory steps. Back to the point that is related uh, to animal language. So when we talk about human and animal language in a way of contrast or comparison, we would say that human language 
has several characteristics, several distinctive features. Mainly, mainly, it is, it is evolutionary. That means it is developing. That means it is in a way to evolve, to develop, to change from one generation to another, maybe less than a period of generation, which is agreed about to be about 33 years. Uh, so e evolutionary, developmental. So whereas the animal language is constant. Why constant? Because it is basically linked, utterly related to daily biological needs, food, danger, and the like. But human language is related to all the various aspects of life. So that we may refer to, to uh, cultural transfer, to, discipl to displacement, to what is mentioned by uh, Noam Chomsky, creativity, added to productivity. So when you say productivity and creativity, which is defined in the, in the reference uh, written by John Lyons, Language and Linguistics, of course, uh, segregated by Noam Chomsky, creativity and productivity. When we say productivity, that means uh, from a finite set of utterances, we get, we produce, we generate a finite, yeah, a finite, a limited set of utterances. So from a, from a finite set of rules, we derive a finite set of of utterances. It means it's clear for everyone. Not for everyone, but we are talking about specialists, men and women of the field. So whereas when you talk about creativity, so here it is something different. It is something different from productivity. That means we have a finite set of rules from which we have an infinite number of utterances. Yeah, but here, the nature of utterances, the nature of utterances, or the utterance that is related to creativity, has the feature of, has two features: the feature of newness and the feature of conformity of the already to the already existing rules. So, is to create, is to bring out new utterances that have not been encountered before, but not encountered before. That means new and they conform to the already existing rules. So this is creativity. Productivity, you have a set of rules. For example, you have 50 rules, and you may have, by the end, the output, 50 utterances. But in creativity, you have the 50 rules. You have the 50 rules, out of which you might have not only 50, you may have 55 or 53 utterances. Those additional utterances have the feature of newness and conformity to the already uh, working, functioning rules. So this is, this is uh, one main aspect of the human language when compared to animal language. So we have also duality, human language, human language is a spoken and written with so whereas whereas the animal language is basically relying on sounds on sounds on sounds uh, other features related to human language uh, we may refer here is the fact that uh, it is it is having the the feature of uh, Cultural transfer, cultural transfer. So cultural transfer, that means from one generation to another. Uh, of course, this is, uh, as has already been mentioned, related to the change in all the conditions that are working in harmony within a specific speaking community. So talking about linguistics as a science has just, has just emerged Early 
at the beginning of the 20th century. So talking about the 1907 till the year 1911. In this period, in this period, the star students of the founder of linguistics, Ferdinand D. Saussure, those star students amassed, gathered his lectures that were delivered, that were presented by him at the level of the University of Geneva, Switzerland. But they were just published in the year 1960 through a masterpiece that is entitled Cours de Linguistique Générale, General Course in Linguistics. That general course of linguistics was a kind of a revolution in linguistics. A revolution in linguistics. How was that? A revolution that made certain changes, certain changes in the field of linguistics. The first change, the first principle of this change is that language is self-sufficient. Language or linguistics is meant to study language in itself for itself. Language is a social fact. So these two points in particular, these two points in particular, can be contrasted, can be compared to the previously dealt with principles during the traditional grammar era in which language was dependent on philosophy, on logic, and language was not really independent. So with the coming of this Saussure, language now is self-sufficient. Study language in itself for itself. We may refer here to certain characteristics related to traditional grammar and armchair, armchair grammarians. So basically, before the emergence of linguistics as an independent science, there was the talk about, about uh, armchair grammarians, first of all. What is meant by armchair grammarians? Armchair grammarians were men and women of, of language, of grammar. The main concern was not to study language as a whole, but to just focusing on grammar. So grammar is important, but it is not the whole business. As described by one of the specialists saying, with grammar, a list can be conveyed. With vocabulary, everything can be conveyed. That means they were focusing just on grammar, on writing, they excluded speaking, they focused on translation, and a main feature was the centrality of the teacher. This is, of course, associated with the GTM, Grammar Translation Method, which was the first uh, teaching approach. Here, approach, approach is meant, is meant to refer to the a theory. So we have approach, which is purely theoretical. Method is the how to apply the theory. And technique is a purely concrete, practical. So another feature related to the traditional grammar era is item-centered. That means elements of language were studied in isolation. In isolation. There was also immanence of long. What is meant by immanence of long? That means uh, only rules, only mainly rules. Language study was restricted to rules long means long means the abstract system the abstract system so that that is that is why the uh, the uh, that era of traditional grammar was meant to be prescriptive that means armchair grammarians were just in a way to prescribe so the don'ts and the do's, do this, do that, do not do this, do not do that. This was the main tenet, the main principle. Other, another point related to that era was diachronic studies. That means 
language phenomena were studied through time. That means the accumulation of all the, uh, the views and all the descriptions and all the analysis through time of any given phenomenon. In contrast, with the coming of the Sosur, so especially through the four dichotomies, yeah, there were certain new aspects which were added, which were added to the previously found principles. New, new parameters, new criteria were added to the already existing principles, and some were rejected. Let's start with those which were, which were completed, not rejected. So here we have the addition that was identified, that was proposed by De Saussure, was the synchronic studies. When we say the synchronic studies, not in contrast, but in a complementary view with the diachronic studies, synchronic studies, synchronic, sync, alike, chronis, chronic, chronos, that means at the same time, is to study a language phenomenon at a specific point in time, whether this point is at the present or past. It is unlike the diachronic studies that were meant to study language through time. That means a kind of a holistic view. But here, with the identification of these synchronic studies, so is to study a particular phenomenon at a specific point in time, whether this point is at the present or in the past. So what is the difference in between studying a specific, specific phenomenon at a specific point in time, at the present or in the past? At the present. It is agreed upon to be a preferable, let's say, uh, choice. So when we study a specific phenomenon, at the present, that means all the necessary, let's say, ingredients, all the necessary circumstances are at hand, at the reach of the researcher. That means that they are accessible, able to be compared, contrasted, identified, analyzed, and the like. At the present, synchronic at a specific point in time, also, with limiting the scope of studying such a phenomenon in the past, gives a kind of easiness for the researcher in order to reap satisfactory results. So this is what is, what is brought by, what was brought by De Saussure at the level of time. So as a kind of a complementary view to the di diachronic studies, so here having the synchronic <coughs> ones. <coughs> this is identified as, as a dichotomy. The second dichotomy, which is meant uh, to be uh, a complementary aspect to the already existing uh, principle in the, within the traditional uh, grammar era, was parole. So long and parole. Long, as we have said previously, long is the abstract system, is the set of rules that has already been existent during the era. So abstract rules, written rules in particular. But with the coming of the Saussure now, it is the valorization of speech. As we have said previously, that speaking was utterly excluded. So when we have now, Parole. parole is the concrete realization of long. Long is the system. Parole is the concrete realization of the system. This is something important to be mentioned. As a, a dichotomy. When you say a dichotomy, of course, die, de. Die, that means having two faces of the same coin. So long and parole. Long is the, is the first coin, which is the rules the basket of rules, principles, and parole is the concrete realization. So here, it is the theory and the practice, meanwhile, at the same time. Like time, we have dichronic through time and synchronic at a particular point in time, whether that point is at the present or in the past. The third dichotomy that was brought by De Saussure, of course, it is said to be the most 
clear, the, the clearest, sorry, the clearest and the most prominent, the most prominent, the most prominent uh, proof that makes structuralism uh, attractive, let's say. When we say uh, that it is the most attractive dichotomy, so we are talking about paradigmatic and syntagmatic relations. Relations. So uh, during the, uh, the previous era, we had item-centered analysis. So now with structuralism, we have structure-based analysis, meaning no language element, no language element has a value in isolation without being referred to the other elements of the language. And here within this dichotomy, we may know clearly that, that there is the notion of rela relationalism. So we start with paradigmatic relations. When we say paradigmatic relations, we are talking about the paradigm. So we have paradigm, paradigmatic. That means the relations that occur in between elements of different sentences. For example, we have the sentence, Peter writes a message. So Peter here is the subject. So we may replace the subject with its opponent within the second sentence, having he wrote or he has written a message. So Peter and he. That means here we have the relation in between Peter and he. Peter is the, is the noun and he is the pronoun. So, of course, we do know that the subject may be a noun or an adjective noun or an article adjective noun or an adjective article, an, ad, uh, an article adjective noun with a connector and a noun. So, in the form of a noun, a phrase. Yeah, so that means here the, the, the possibility of exchanging exchanging a given element, whether this element is a, is, a, is a subject or is a verb or is an object, this possibility is called paradigmatic relation. It is called a vertical relation. Vertical relation in between language elements that uh, are found with different sentences. So uh, we have these relations in between, in between subjects, nouns, uh, verbs and pronouns. We may also find these relations existing within, within words, within words, semantically speaking, semantically speaking. For example, when we have a bad, bad milk, we say it is a curdled milk. When we have a bad meat, we say rotten, rotten milk, as it is mentioned by the American uh, poet uh, Benjamin Franklin said, uh, he once said, if you don't want to be forgotten as soon as you are dead and rotten, either write things worth reading or do things worth writing. We may also have these relations existing in between, in between let's say, uh, sounds or what is called technically, phonetically speaking, phonemes. Phoneme, which is the smallest unit of sound. For example, we have the three words. We have put and cut and... Uh, not, for example. So the three initial, let's say, letters yeah, are interchangeable. That means the second and the third are the same. The UT, the UT, and the UT. So the difference is just in the, 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 the initial letters. So this, these are called paradigmatic relations. Now, talking about the second face of the coin, of the dichotomy, which is syntagmatic. So when we say syntagmatic, we are talking about syntax. We are talking about the arrangement of elements within the same sentence. As we have said previously, so the agreed upon, the conventional order, is subject, verb, object. Subject, verb, object. Unlike the Arabic language in which we have the subject, verb, object, or the, uh, the verb, subject, object. So the subject with its different forms Noun, adjective noun, article adjective noun, ad article adjective noun, uh, connector uh, uh, noun, uh, and the like, the different. So here 
we have a subject that is in relation with the verb, despite the nature of this verb, whether this verb is conjugated in the simple or present or in a, in a, in a simple tense or in syntagmatic relations. So here there are logical, logical agreed upon relations in between the subject verb, subject verb and object. So this a chain of, of the, uh, let's say, of the uh, combinatorial, let's say, uh, relations that exist in between the elements of the same sentence, unlike the relations that exist in between the different sentences within paradigmatic relations. So here we may stop and postpone talking about the remaining, the remaining uh, dichotomy uh, brought by De Saussure as a novelty as a reaction to the already existing principles here in the traditional uh, grammar area. Thank you for your kind attention and hopefully we would meet in next occasions. Thank you.